Today's video is sponsored by Fabulous, the number one self-care app that helps you build better habits and achieve your goals. Fabulous uses the proven tenets of behavioral science to help you build healthy habits one task at a time. So, well, how does it work? Well, let's say you're working from home these days. A lot of people are, but you're struggling to fit exercise and healthy eating into your new routine. Sounds familiar. Or maybe you're a writer who's having trouble finding the time throughout the day to put pen to paper. Everybody's got something they're trying to work on, right? Fabulous is going to help you create new habits that really last by giving you a friendly, intuitive day planner that'll help create a long-lasting routine. Its self-guided mode keeps you on track to breaking down larger tasks into smaller, bite-sized goals. Or if you're looking for something a little more active, Fabulous can offer advice and guidance on everything from professional development to mental wellness. Pretty soon, you're checking things off your calendar like an absolute boss. It's like having both a task manager as well as a coach right in the palm of your hand. So create yourself a little schedule with a task list and let Fabulous keep you honest. Before you know it, Fabulous has gotten you into a good routine and you're well on your way to your own personal goals. So start building an ideal daily routine right now as a special deal for you guys. The first 100 people who click on the link in the description below will get a free week-long trial plus 25% of a Fabulous premium membership. So try it out. There's a link below and on to today's video. Imagine the following scenario. Your country declares war on another and you're drafted into the army. You're given a rifle, trained how to use it, and you're sent into combat. On reaching the battlefield, your unit comes under attack. As the enemy advances on your position, you raise your rifle and line up a shot on the nearest soldier. Suddenly, you freeze. You've never killed anyone before. The idea is alien and abhorrent to you. But as the enemy soldier draws closer, you realize it's him or you and your fate, that of your comrades, and perhaps even that of your nation, depends on what you do next. So do you take the shot? While you might be tempted to say, yeah, absolutely, well, don't be so sure. For despite what common sense and centuries of military tradition might tell us, getting someone to kill a fellow human is actually a lot harder than it might seem. For thousands of years, military leaders believed that the average soldier would kill in combat without hesitation, either to preserve his own life or those of his comrades to defend his country or simply because his superiors ordered him to do so. However, until fairly recently, no one thought to actually test this assumption. Then, during the Second World War, Brigadier General S.L.A. Marshall, a U.S. Army journalist and historian, conducted a groundbreaking study. Marshall traveled to battlefields across Europe and the Pacific theaters and interviewed thousands of soldiers from more than 400 infantry companies, asking them exactly what it was they actually did in combat. The results were wholly unexpected. Marshall found that out of every 100 men on the firing line, only around 15 to 20 would actually engage the enemy with their weapons. This statistic did not vary with the theater of operations or with the type or duration of combat, holding true whether a battle lasted hours or days or whether the soldiers were facing inexperienced Italian troops or suicidal Japanese Banzai charges. In almost every single case, nearly three quarters of the men simply refused to fire at the enemy. In his seminal 1947 book, Men Against Fire, The Problem of Battle Command, Marshall concludes that, contrary to long-held beliefs, the average soldier is not a natural-born killer, and that the average and healthy individual, the man who can endure the mental and physical stresses of combat, still has such an inner and usually unrealized resistance towards killing a fellow man that he will not, of his own volition, take life if it is possible to turn away from that responsibility. At the vital point, he becomes a conscientious objector. This reluctance to kill did not, however, mean that three quarters of soldiers were cowards. On the contrary, Marshall found that in the heat of battle, most of these conscientious objectors willingly performed feats of extraordinary bravery, such as rescuing the wounded, fetching ammunition, and carrying messages while under heavy fire. Clearly, these men were not afraid to take great personal risks in support of their comrades. Their only qualms were with the act of actually killing itself. I well recall the great sense of relief that came to troops when they were passed to a quiet sector. This was due not so much to the realization that things were safer there as to the blessed knowledge that for a time they were not under the compulsion to take life. Marshall's study proved highly controversial, contradicting, as it did, centuries of military orthodoxy. In more recent years, critics have attacked Marshall's research methods as flawed and questioned the validity of his infamous 15-20% to figure, even claiming that Marshall made up most of his data. Nonetheless, subsequent studies on other conflicts have upheld Marshall's basic conclusions and revealed that the problem of soldiers refusing to fire has been around a lot longer than 
many dared imagine. In his 2009 book on killing the psychological costs of learning to kill in war and society, former U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman explains that traditional assumptions about how soldiers react to combat are based on the fight-or-flight model of physiological response to stress, wherein a soldier, when faced with the enemy, has only two possible courses of action, engage and kill the enemy or run away. As most men do not wish to be seen as cowards, the theory goes they will have no choice but to fight. But as Grossman points out, this model is overly simplistic, that there are, in fact, two more rarely discussed options. Posture or submit. Rather than attacking, a soldier can instead pretend to attack in the hopes of intimidating the enemy and encouraging them to break off their attack. Conversely, instead of running away, a soldier can simply fall down and play dead, hopefully resulting in the enemy ignoring him. As French military theorist Ardon de Pique pointed out in the 1860s, if a man falls and disappears, who knows whether it was a bullet or the fear of advancing attack that struck him. In both cases, the end goal is to avoid actual violence and bloodshed. Indeed, as Grossman points out, posturing and submission have been integral parts of warfare since the dawn of history. Oxford social psychologist Peter Marsh notes that this is true in New York street gangs, it is true in so-called primitive tribesmen and warriors, and it is true in almost any culture in the world. All have the same patterns of aggression and have very orchestrated, highly ritualized patterns of posturing, mock battle, and submission. These rituals restrain and focus the violence on relatively harmless posturing and display. What is created is a perfect illusion of violence. Aggression, yes. Competitiveness, yes. But only a very tiny, tiny level of actual violence. There is, concludes Gwyn Dyer, the occasional psychopath who really wants to slice people open, but most of the participants are really interested in status, display, profit, and damage limitation. One prominent example of such ritual mock combat is the Native American practice of counting coup. In this, simply touching an enemy warrior was considered a more courageous and meaningful act than killing him. Such traditional societies with their relatively low population numbers and birth rates could hardly afford to lose large numbers of people in combat, and so rituals of posturing, intimidation, and submission often took the place of actual violence and killing for the settling of everyday disputes. According to Grossman, this tendency toward posturing continued all the way into the modern age, helping to explain an unexpected phenomenon which accompanied the introduction of firearms to the battlefield. Early smooth-bore flintlock muskets were wildly inaccurate, forcing armies to march in tight formation and fire massive volleys at each other at ranges of less than 100 meters. In such conditions, even the smooth-bore musket could be devastatingly effective, as evidenced by an experiment conducted by the Prussian army in the late 1700s. In this test, an infantry battalion fired at a target 30 meters wide by 2 meters tall, representing an enemy unit. This resulted in a hit rate ranging from 25% at 225 yards to 60% at 75 yards. Given these figures, which have been confirmed by more modern experiments using laser tag style mock weapons, one would expect an 18th or 19th century infantry duel to be a spectacularly bloody affair. Yet the reality was far different. According to historian Paddy Griffith, the average Napoleonic musket volley only resulted in an average of one or two casualties per side. Indeed, far from being brutal slaughters, such firefights dragged on until exhaustion set in or nightfall put an end to hostilities. Casualties mounted because the contest went on for so long, not because the fire was particularly deadly. And advancements in firearms technology did little to improve the situation. Soldiers of the American Civil War, though armed with more accurate rifled muskets, barely managed to hit rates higher than their 18th century ancestors. And even during the 1879 Battle of Rock's Drift, in which the defending British troops fired their breech-loading Martini Henry rifles point-blank into masses of attacking Zulu warriors, an average of 13 rounds were fired for each hit. In each of these cases, there is a vast disconnect between the theoretical effectiveness of soldiers' weapons and their actual performance on the battlefield. So the question arises, why? According to Marshall, Griffith, Grossman, and others, the answer lies in the soldiers' innate resistance to killing and the superiority of firearms over earlier weapons as an instrument of posturing. Prior to the advent of firearms, most combat occurred at close quarters using swords, spears, pikes, and other hand-to-hand -hand weapons. Under such conditions, it was extremely difficult for a soldier to fake an attack, for doing so would most likely result in their own death. Firearms, however, provided the average soldier with a layer of plausible deniability. It was easy enough for a soldier to slightly raise his musket and fire over the enemy's head without his commanding officer noticing, allowing him to fake the act of killing without actually killing anyone. As Grossman points out, firearms 
guns were also more intimidating than older weapons, giving their users a great psychological advantage. Gunpowder's superior noise, its superior posturing ability, made it ascendant on the battlefield. The longbow would still have been used in the Napoleonic Wars if raw mathematics of killing effectiveness was all that mattered, since both the longbow's firing rate and its accuracy were much greater than that of a smoothbore musket. But a frightened man thinking with his midbrain and going plink, plink, plink with a bow doesn't stand a chance against an equally frightened man going bang, bang with a musket. The extent of the posturing and plausible deniability made possible by firearms is dramatically illustrated by the discovery on the Gettysburg battlefield of over 6,000 rifles with up to 20 bullets stacked up inside the barrel. The sheer numbers of such overloaded firearms indicates that many Civil War soldiers, unable to bring themselves to actually shoot a fellow human being, nonetheless went through the motions of reloading their weapon, possibly even shouldering and pretending to shoot it before starting the whole process over again. Indeed, at around the same time, Ardon de Pique conducted a detailed survey of French officers in which he discovered that a certain number of our soldiers fired almost in the air without aiming, seeming to want to stun themselves to become drunk on rifle fire during this gripping crisis. This phenomenon continued well into the 20th century, with Lieutenant George Rupel, a British commander during the First World War, reporting that the only way to stop his men from firing high and deliberately missing the enemy was to walk down the trench, quote, beating the men on the backside, and as I got their attention, telling them to fire low. As Marshall discovered in his study in the Second World War, the vast majority of the actual fighting and killing was done by less than a quarter of the men in each unit, with the rest performing supporting tasks like running or loading ammunition, spotting targets, and tending the wounded. Surprisingly, the presence of so many non-firers did not appear to affect the morale or effectiveness of the actual firers. Indeed, in most cases, the knowledge that they were being well supported by their comrades enabled these men to carry on shooting. Even more surprisingly, this pattern also seemed to apply to armies of far more militaristic societies such as Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, and despite Marshall's well-publicized findings, this trend continued well beyond the Second World War. During the Vietnam War, it is estimated that an astounding 50,000 bullets were fired for each enemy soldier killed. As Douglas Graham, a medic with the 1st Marine Division, reported, One of the things that amazed me is how many bullets can be fired during a firefight without anyone getting hurt. Strangely, the average soldier's deep-seated resistance to killing his fellow man had been known about for decades before martial study, as evidenced by the traditional procedure for military executions by firing squad. In most cases, one member of the firing squad is given a rifle loaded with a blank cartridge or a wax bullet. The intent is to produce a diffusion of responsibility in which each member of the squad can plausibly believe that he did not fire a fatal shot. However, this practice is based on the outdated notion that a soldier will only be reluctant to shoot a member of his own unit and that when faced with the enemy he will not hesitate to kill. But by the end of the Second World War, it had become clear that this was not the case, and that drastic measures would have to be taken to overcome soldiers' reluctance to kill and turn them into more effective fighting machines. As the United States military discovered over the following decades, the key to getting men to kill is to bypass logical reasoning and moral reflection entirely and make killing an instinctive, automatic act devoid of conscious thought. Prior to and during the Second World War, basic weapons training involved the soldier shooting at a bullseye target on a fixed range. This setup bore little resemblance to actual combat, and when soldiers arrived on the battlefield and encountered living, breathing human targets, the disconnect made them reluctant to fire. Thus, starting in the 1950s, the bullseyes were replaced by human silhouette targets, and the fixed range, with a more realistic simulation of combat in which these targets would pop up from behind cover for several seconds before disappearing, was implemented. The idea of such training is that after sufficient repetition, the act of shooting at human targets becomes instinctive and automatic. Thus, in the heat and stress, of actual battle, the soldier falls back on his training and muscle memory and engages the enemy without thought or hesitation. The results of such conditioning are astounding. By the Korean War, the firing rate among American soldiers had increased from 20 to nearly 55 percent. By the Vietnam War, this figure had increased to between 90 and 95 percent. Today, it is almost 100%. According to Grossman, many soldiers, after they have met a real-life emergency, report that they just carried out the correct drill and completed it before they realized that they were not in the simulator. But the willingness to kill is not all about their conditioning. Many other factors influence the effectiveness of soldiers in combat. While traditionally military leaders believed that the threat of death was a powerful enough motivation to kill, research has shown that this is not the case, and that the vast majority of soldiers will still refuse to engage the enemy, even 
even when their own lives are in immediate danger. The lives of their comrades, however, are a different matter. Time and time again, research and battlefield testimony has shown that soldiers will perform extraordinary acts of bravery in order to save their fellow soldiers, and that the closeness of a military unit is one of the greatest predictors of its combat effectiveness. Indeed, when Aldi Murphy, the most decorated American soldier of World War II, was asked what motivated him to take on an entire German infantry company single-handedly, he simply responded, they were killing my friends. The closeness of a military unit also introduces another powerful motivating factor, peer pressure. As David Grossman explains, among men who are bonded together so intensely, there is a powerful process of peer pressure in which the individual cares so deeply about his comrades and what they think about him that he would rather die than let them down. A US Marine Corps Vietnam vet interviewed by Gwyn Dyer communicated this process clearly when he said that your first instinct, regardless of all your training, is to live. But you can't turn around and run the other way. Peer pressure, you know? Dyer calls this a special kind of love that has nothing to do with sex or idealism, and Sergeant Peak referred to this as mutual surveillance and considered it to be the predominant psychological factor on the battlefield. The motivating effects of peer pressure and mutual surveillance also extend to officers, with SLA Marshall noting that during World War II, nearly all soldiers would fire when an officer was present. When the officer left, the firing rate fell back to 20%. The effect also explains why crew served weapons like machine guns and mortars typically have a greater firing rates than individual riflemen. Indeed, even under the direst of circumstances, morale can be maintained so long as the combat unit retains its cohesiveness, as Peter Watson explains in War on the Mind. Disintegration of a combat unit usually occurs at the 50% casualty point, and is marked by increasing numbers of individuals refusing to kill in combat. Motivation and will to kill the enemy has evaporated along with their peers and comrades. Another important factor which influences soldiers' willingness to kill is distance from the enemy, whether physical, cultural, or moral. The more unlike a soldier the enemy is, the easier they are to kill. For example, in one World War II survey, 44% of American soldiers expressed a desire to kill Japanese soldiers, while only 6% expressed equal enthusiasm for killing German soldiers, whom they shared a lot culturally. A classic method for creating cultural and moral distance is to refer to the enemy by a derogatory nickname, such as Huns and Krauts for the Germans, Nips for the Japanese, and Gooks, Slopes, or Charlie for the Vietnamese. Such names make the enemy appear less than human and thus easier to kill. Such dehumanization, however, can quickly get out of hand, especially when combined with shoot on site combat training or when applied outside the military context. As former U.S. Border Patrol officer Bill Jordan explains, this has become a particular problem among many U.S. US law enforcement agencies, there is a natural disinclination to pull the trigger when your weapon is pointed at a human. Even though their own life was at stake, most officers report having this trouble in their first fight. To aid in overcoming this resistance, it is helpful if you can will yourself to think of your opponent as a mere target and not as a human being. In this connection, you should go further and pick a spot on the target. This will allow better concentration and further remove the human elements from your thinking. If this works for you, try to continue this thought in allowing yourself no remorse. A man who will resist an officer with weapons has no respect for the rules by which decent people are governed. He is an outlaw who has no place in world society. His removal is completely justified and should be accomplished dispassionately and without regret. But one form of distance which does not appear to influence our willingness to kill is physical distance. David Grossman ends on killing on a dour note, warning that violent video games, by replicating the desensitizing and conditioning functions of modern military training, are breeding a new generation of violent, uninhibited potential criminals. However, study after study has shown no appreciable link between violent video games and real-world violence, indicating that the two are worlds apart and that the vast majority of people can easily tell the difference. Indeed, when the US armed forces first began fielding Predator drones, it was widely believed that the sheer physical distance between the pilot and the target would create a complete disconnect from the realities of war, making the experience seem less than real, almost like playing a video game. Therefore, it was thought drone pilots would not suffer from PTSD. Experience has shown, however, that this distance actually does little to ease the reality and trauma of killing a fellow human being, and that drone pilots actually suffer from PTSD at the same rate as regular combat pilots.
The upshot of all of this is perhaps best summed up by historian and journalist Gwyn Dyer, who writes, There is such a thing as a natural soldier, the kind who derives his greatest satisfaction from male companionship, from excitement, and from the conquering of physical obstacles. He doesn't want to kill people as such, but he will have no objections if it occurs within a moral framework that gives him justification, like war, and if it is the price of gaining admission to the kind of environment he craves. Whether such men are born or made, I do not know. But most of them end up in armies, and many move on again to become mercenaries because regular army life in peacetime is too routine and boring. But armies are not full of such men. They are so rare that they form only a modest fraction of even small professional armies, mostly congregating in the commando-type special forces. In large conscript armies, they virtually disappear beneath the weight of numbers of more ordinary men. And it is these ordinary men who do not like combat at all that armies must persuade to kill. Until only a generation ago, they did not even realize how bad a job they were doing. Thus, rather than doom and gloom, Marshall and Grossman's findings should instead fill us with cautious optimism. After all, if the average person, even when given a weapon, the full sanction of their nation and faced with imminent death, will still refuse to kill their fellow man, then perhaps there's hope for humanity after all. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.